considering him who, who endured such things or such contradiction of sinners against himself. And then he says in verse 4, you know, you need to put things in perspective, Jeff. You need to get a grip because you've not resisted sin on the blood like Jesus did. Get, get a perspective here. Get a grip. And he says, he says, you have your own lanes to run in this race. And the process, and, and in the process of that, God chastens us. He, he spanks us. He instructs us. He encourages us. He disciplines us. He builds us up within that process. And then he goes on to tell us in later verses that, that we, had heaven, or we had earthly fathers who did the same thing. They chastened us, but they did so after their own pleasure, after their own selfishness. But your heavenly father, he says, does it strictly for our benefit or strictly for our profit so that we would be partakers of his holiness. And then he says this too. He says, the chastening that we receive of the Lord is, is, is not pleasant while you're in the midst of the chastening, while you're going through it. But he says, nevertheless, nevertheless, afterward, he says, it, it, it produces, it, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So, so this journey is an exercise. He's, he's taking you and I to the gym, working us out. And so since we have all of these witnesses from the Old Testament in chapter 11 that he gave us who ran this race as examples for us, and now you and I as believers have, have more things, uh, have things clearer in sight. We see things more clearly than they did. And because we are looking off unto Jesus, he says, let us run this race with endurance. Let us run this race with patience. See, I need that. Because I know this, and you know it too. As I turn the television on, this race that we're running, as I turn the TV on, and I watch the news, I can't help but think the finish line is near. It's close. And then he gives us verse 12 to verse 17. He says, wherefore, be, because of this, lift up the hands which hang down. My hands hang down at times. And, and the feeble knees, and, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, and he gives us three lests, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornication or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears." So he says, in this race, and, and as we receive the chastisement from our Heavenly Father, he says, it's only for our benefit, it's only for our profit. He says, there are some, there are some encouragements here, there are some consolations, there are some cautions or some warnings here as well. And some of the consolations that he gives us, some of the encouragements that we get are, hey, hey, Jeff, look, we're nearing the finish line. We're, we're, we're getting close. Get your hands up. Get, get your hands up. Strengthen those knees that are, that are, that are wobbly, that feel like rubber, that, that are wearing out. And then he says in verse 13, make, make straight, King James says, straight the paths. The idea is make smooth the paths. Your Bible might even say smooth. The paths for your feet, the, the ones, the paths that you're running on in this race, so that your joints are not out of place and, and twisting and, and turning, but rather there's, there's healing in this journey. And then he says in, in verse 14, he says, but follow peace with all men and, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. 
And then he moves on to the cons and, and the warnings and cautions given us three less. And I'll read them to you here. Looking diligently, unless any man fail the grace of God, unless any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, unless there be any fornication or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. So, there, so then there are these three warnings. When I go back to verse 12 and, and I read it, it says, because of this, because of this, lift up your hands which hang down and your feeble knees. How many of you played football, basketball, baseball, soccer, Holy, ice hockey? Sheesh. It sounds like my football coach from high school. It sounds like my gym teacher. Come on. I know you're in the race. Come on. Come on. Get your hands up. Let's go. Push a little harder. Push a little harder. We're getting close to the end zone. Come on. Hurry up. Football camp started. Kids have been in football camp for a month already. Hurry up. Hurry up. Go, go, go. Push. That's the idea. Your hands are hanging down. Get them up. Get them up. Your knees are weak. He's challenging them. I believe he's challenging us to dig deeper, to, to reinvigorate, to strengthen. You're getting close to the finish line. Come on. And, and then verse 13, and make straight paths. He says, make, make, make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the ways. Your joints, your ligaments be twisted and turned and popped out of the socket. But let it rather be healed. Make the rest of your course smooth, he says. Come on, get your hands up. Keep pushing through so that you... So that as you run, it's easier on those knees. Nothing is getting bent or twisted out of socket. But even in this difficult race, there, there can the idea is that, that but let it be rather be healed. There, that, there, in this race, even though it's difficult, there can be a healing. It's almost like a coach saying, come on, it's the fourth quarter. We have two minutes left. Two minutes. Leave it all on the field. Don't take anything to the locker room with you. Think about what lies ahead of you, boys. And so there's that encouragement. And this week, as I read that, because he's talking about a race, our race, your race, my race. I went online and I typed, I Googled marathons, te marathon testimonials. Anybody ever ran a marathon? Probably all of you have that. Nobody ran it that they're football players or baseball. Anybody run a marathon? Linda ran a marathon. She probably ran it backwards. She started at mile 26.4 and ran backwards, didn't you? <laughs> That's what I meant by backwards, not that you ran up. But I, I, I wrote down one guy's testimonial as I read it. I want you to listen. It's not very long, but listen. Listen to what he said. And I'm paraphrasing some of the stuff he said. He said, it was getting close to the 26-mile mark. Five miles to go. I'm out of gas. I've hit a wall. The winner, the winner has already long gone across the finish line. But I'm running against my time. I could still beat my best time. People behind me are, are walking. People behind me are holding each other up. They're, they're helping each other. The, the, the goal is to just get across the finish line. People on the side of the roads are cheering. Come on, run, run, run. Don't walk. He said, my quads are burning. I'm sick in my stomach. I'm nauseous. I'm thirsty. I, I have a headache. My knees feel like rubber. I have blisters on my feet. And, and you're just thinking, get past the wall. Take another breath. Come on. And then finally, the finish line comes into view. And you begin to pick it up. You begin to pick it up. You begin to run. You begin to sprint. You begin to push. People are cheering. Thousands of people have already crossed the finish line before I, in front of me, before I, I even got here. But I broke my time. And when I read the scriptures, I just read that here. 
I just read that right here. And, and you think, come on, guys. Your hands are hanging down. You're shot. Your quads are burning. You, you, your knees are shaking. You've got to run. We're trying to make the rest of this race as smooth as, as we can, as best we can. We don't want anyone popping their knees or their hips out of joint, out of socket, but rather healing because of the one who is accompanying us, the one who is chastening us for our benefit and for our profit, so that on this journey we can be partakers of his holiness. And, and the peaceable fruit of righteousness will be produced in our lives. And we have to run the race with that in mind. That's the stage that I get when I read this. That's the kind of encouragement. And can I tell you, I need that. Because I lose sight of the finish line. I get so lost in my life. I get so lost in all of this. And in me, I get lost in me. And I forget why I'm running the race. I forget that I'm even in a race. And he says, come on. Get your eyes focused. And folks, when you can see the finish line, there's nothing else around you that matters but that finish line. I believe the finish line is in view. Yeah, I know. They've been saying it for 2,000 years. But there is no generation of the church that has lived in any... The church today is closer than any church, generation of the church. And then he tells me this. He gives me that boost. And then he says this in verse 14, which I find hard to swallow. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Follow. The word follow is an imperative. It's present tense. It means you must continually follow. You must continually not follow. Okay, you go ahead. I'll, I'll follow you. No, pursue. You must continually pursue. You must seek diligently. You must, present imperative, pursue peace with all men. Now, I can stop right there. Can you think of someone that you need to make peace with? Just me? Wow. Wow. Maybe I should stop there. Look, we are selfish in our fallen nature. But he tells us here that we are to pursue peace with all men. Listen, it doesn't come naturally. But it doesn't lower his standard. We need to seek after it, pursue after it diligently. I listened to a pastor a while back, and I wrote this comment down. I thought it fit good right in here. I think it was Greg Laurie. He said this. Grace received becomes grace bestowed. You ever heard that before? Grace received becomes grace bestowed. When you realize what the Lord has done for you, it eliminates any license that you have to not be gracious to someone else. If you're sitting here in the church today and you're thinking, yeah, I need God's grace, but that person over there needs it a lot more than I do, then you really don't have a concept, anything, of what God's grace is. Our attitude sitting here this morning should be for me to be sitting here on a Sunday morning from where I came from, that's all grace. And then grace received becomes grace bestowed. He tells us in verse 14, follow peace. You are to seek diligently. It's not a suggestion. You are to continually pursue peace with all men. 
Now the Apostle Paul says, that I like this verse a little bit better than what he says here, but the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 12, in verse 18, he tells us, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. I like that a little better because it gives me a little more license, right? Because I can say, well, Lord, that's as much as is within me. No. He says, constantly pursue peace in our race, in our journey, because if we do not, anything else slows us down or trips us up. And not only should we diligently seek peace with all men, but also holiness, he says. We are to diligently be pursuing holiness or sanctification. In other words, here it is. We're born again. Our nature changes. Paul says that, that, that we are a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things are old. Behold, all things are become new. What we're born again, our nature changes, and part of our very nature should be that we should seek peace with all men. That's sanctification. Let me clear this up because there's a big misconception in the holy church today. We don't get more holy by our own effort. <laughs> Here's why. Because his righteousness is bestowed upon us. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says this about my righteousness and yours. It says, but we are all as an unclean thing. All of us are as an unclean thing. And all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as the leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. We don't get more holy by our own effort, effort. Because our own effort, our righteousness are as filthy rags. God's righteousness is imputed upon us. But that doesn't remove us. That doesn't remove from us then the desire to walk in sanctification to grow in grace. In fact, he says the very reason, we just read this last week, the very reason that he chastens us is for our profit. It's for our benefit. In verse 10, so that we might be partakers of his holiness. And then he says in the next verse, which was last week too, that that chastening produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And now he's telling us that we need to be at peace with all men. You need to be constantly pursuing peace with all men in this race. We, in this race, it's not against other Christians, but it's your own race. And you're pursuing holiness, sanctification. And the longer you're in this race, the longer that you are in your lane in this race, your life should become cleaner. Your life should become more distinct. You should sin less and repent more. Constantly pursuing that sanctif sanctification. Here, here, here's, here's maybe a crude or a rough picture of it. But we, we get saved and we go, we, we get saved, we give our lives to Christ. We're like, All right, I'm not using drugs anymore. Yeah, I'm not spending my time in the bar anymore. I'm not living immorally anymore. Yeah, I got rid of those big things out of my life. Yeah, they're gone. But back then, you would have never thought that someday, one day, you would hear God's voice say to you, don't even think that. Whoa. We got rid of all the, yeah, well, I'm doing this. How much of it now? Don't even think that, Jeff. Don't, don't watch that. Don't listen to that. Part of, part of walking more and more in the light 
is being more and more aware of the traitor inside of us. He says, you need to be constantly pursuing peace with all men, pursuing sanctification, holiness. Those things should be working in your life. And and, and now he's going to switch to the things we need to look out for. He's given us, those were encouragements. (laughs) Those were encouragements. Get your hands up. Pursue peace with all men. Pursue holiness. Now, I want to give you some things you should look out for. We looked at the pros. Here are the cons. Verse 15, he says, looking diligently. (laughs) That's the word. It's one word. It's episkopos. It's episkopos. It means to oversee. To oversee diligently, looking diligently. What that means is that we have a responsibility to oversee ourselves, yes, but also others. Not certainly, not, not, not that we're all bishops. Episcopos is, is the word bishop. It means overseer. It, it, not that we're all bishops in that sense. But it's our word here, and it means to oversee. And the first thing it tells us is that we are to oversee diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Now, let me just clear this up, because we don't fail of the grace of God in regards to our salvation. I don't believe that. But the word fail here means, gives us the idea of lagging behind. Lagging behind. So as you run this race, look around you and see if anyone is lagging behind or getting worn out. You know, just like this, this marathon runner said, I, I looked around, people were walking, they're helping each other. That, that's the picture here. They, they are episcopasing those people. As you look around in this race and you see people lagging behind, you see people struggling, you see people getting wore down, Look around you, then you need to episcopos them. You need to get with them. You need to encourage them. You need to say, listen, God's grace is still, is still here with you. His grace smacks you in the face. As soon as you get up in the morning, it tucks you in the bed. As soon as you go to bed at night, his grace is there. His grace will never leave you. His grace will never forsake you. It's always there for you. We need to encourage those people. And then he tells us this in verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. That's the first lest. Or lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. It tells us several things. Bitterness, first thing it tells us here is that bitterness has a root. Did you know that? Bitterness has a root. Now, I know that no one in this room struggles with bitterness. No one. Absolutely no one but me. Understand that whatever bitterness there is in your life, it has a root. It may be the root of abuse. It may be the root of neglect. It may be from some emotional injury that you've had as a child from your youth. The idea is there is a root to bitterness. And he says we need to encourage one another, not be Pharisees by sticking your nose in everyone's business, but we do need to be encouragers. We are to be bearing one another's burdens. You see someone struggling with bitterness? Ask, how can I pray for you? I've said this over and over again, and I'll say it again. Bitterness is the only substance in the universe that destroys the container that it's contained in. But I said that. He says this about bitterness. Lest any brood of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So his concern about bitterness is that it doesn't stay stagnant. It doesn't just remain stagnant. He says says it, it springs up trouble for you. That's what he says. Look at it. 
springing up trouble you. It springs up trouble for you. It produces bad fruit in your life. Look, if you're, if you're bitter, listen to this. If you're bitter at someone, until you forgive them, you're under their control. You're on, they have power over you. And they don't even know it. When you forgive them, then you're no longer under their control. But now under the Lord's control and you've been set free from that. I hear people say this. Oh, you got to forgive and forget. Look, no, you don't. You got to forgive. But I can't forget. What am I going to do? Take a stinking toothbrush and put it in my ear and scrub it out? What? It's there. You don't forget. There's a difference between the two. Forgiveness is not forgetting. But you don't have to be in bondage. You don't have to be in bondage by them. The second thing we look out for in bitterness is, 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 is if there is a root, he says it'll spring forth and it'll trouble you. Bitterness destroys the container that it's contained in. It destroys you emotionally. Yes, with your emotions. It plays with your emotions. It, it, it'll destroy you mentally. It'll, it'll just wear you out, fatigue you mentally. And listen, oh, science and medicine says it'll destroy you physically. And it certainly throws roadblocks up in your life spiritually. It messes with you. It's the only substance in the universe that will destroy the container it's contained in. And not only will it spring up and trouble you, he says it'll, be def it'll defile many. It's passive. Now, this is, this is interesting. It's passive. It's air to passive. It means they don't even know it. People are defiled and they don't even realize it. It, it. Your bitterness defiling many, they don't even know about it. That's passive. It's passive. The idea is this. If you allow bitterness to be the hallmark of your life, it affects other people. You don't just sin to yourself. So he's telling us here, look out. Oversee in your life yourself, but also others. If you see someone lagging behind in this race, your responsibility is to encourage them. Also, look around if you find bitterness in yourself, he says, and, and, and others understand it's rooted, it's deep. And when it springs forth, it's going to trouble you. And it's going to defile others around you. By the way, Ethel, it's so good to see you this morning. I didn't shake your hand this morning, but I took the wheelchair out there for you, and I'm glad that Mary brought you. I'm glad to have you back. And then look what he says. Bitterness has a root. It'll spring up and trouble you, and it defiles many around you. And then the third thing he says here in verse 16 and 17, he says, lest there be any fornication or profane person as Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And now this writer <clears throat> is talking about fleshly appetites. Those who are failing the grace of God, their, their faith is weak, and then there are those who struggle with bitterness and, and others, uh, and, and, and others that, that, that who are given to fleshly appetites. It's warning about something that was, that was extremely accepted in the Greek culture. It's warning about something that was extremely accepted in the Roman culture. And it's warning about something that is extremely uh, 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 accepted in the American culture. Right now, we live in a culture who is gender insane. And listen, I believe the issue goes back to the garden. You know, the first thing that Adam did after he sinned was cover himself. Why? Because he knew he was naked. Sexual desire. God given. God gave it. Grossly misused. The church trying to figure out what to do with the Gentiles who were, who were getting saved and giving their lives to Christ. In Acts chapter 15, verse 19 and 20, look what they said. 
He says, wherefore, my sentence is this, that we trouble not them. We don't trouble the Gentiles. Which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from such and from things strangled and from blood. And it's because he mentions all of these things. These things would go together. They all went together. And he, and, and he uses Esau as an example. As Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. We know that Esau took foreign wives. And it displeased Isaac, and it displeased Rebekah. It displeased God. But there, there was dark, profane things going on in Esau's life. Profane, the idea, here's what it means. In the Latin, it means outside the temple. Profane, outside the temple. Things that are common. Earlier, we talked about, in verse 10, about so we would be partakers of his holiness. That's someone inside the temple. The Bible says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do we live within that context? And here Esau, we're not going to go back to the whole story of Esau, but here Esau sold his birthright for a pot of beans. And it wasn't even his. It was Jacob's. It belonged to Jacob. But the point is, that meant nothing to Esau, nothing to him. All that Esau cared about was satisfying the appetite of his flesh. And that's what the writer's warning us about. Look, if you're worn out this morning, <laughs> if you're ready to throw in the towel, he says, lift up your hands. Loosen up your knees. He says, come on, we are near the finish line. It's in sight. We can see it. We, we, we want this race to be as smooth as possible because even in the most difficult place, there can be a healing in that. And, and we need to be constantly pursuing peace with all men. Also, also holiness, sanctification. So that your life is given more and more to Christ's likeness. He says, without those things, no, no man will see the Lord. And, and what you need to look out for in your life and in the lives of others as well is, is if you see someone who is lagging behind in this race, someone who is failing of the grace of God, come alongside them and encourage them. Come on, you can do it. Come on, you can do it. Also, look out. There is also a root of bitterness. But boy, when that springs up, it'll trouble you and, and it'll defile others. And, and, and then he says, lastly, as we finish this race, as we finish it, look out for, for fleshly appetites. Because there is a part of us the, 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 there's a part of us that, yes, designed by God, but yes, it has fallen. And in this world, they are trying to be ex expressed in every way possible. But God asked us to reel all that in. Reel that in. And, and, and place it under the truth of his word. And And, and and profane things, they are so hungry for the things of this world that they, 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 they step outside the temple. They, they step outside of his presence, and, and they live in this world. And he says, he says, you know Esau? He says, you remember Esau? You remember what he did? And... And when he realized that there was a double portion, when Esau realized there was a double portion of the inheritance, a physical blessing attached to it, then he begged his father Isaac. He pled with him. He cried. He bawled out to him. But he never attained it. 
he, he sold his birthright. He sold his connection to the Messiah. And so this has been an encouragement to me. Let us run the race. There is a finish line. There is a double portion <laughs> for us. And, and folks, it's the promises of God that we run on. Not information, not facts, but his truth. The finish line is close. Do you believe that? We should be encouraging each other as we are on this journey. There are pros and cons in this journey. We need to be aware of them. Because the next verses, we're going to read it next week. The next verses take us, listen, to that holy city, Zion. It places the finish line right in front of us in a remarkable way. Read ahead. I encourage you to. Let's stand. Father, I thank you for this picture this morning. I, as I read this passage, I had my old gym teacher and football coach, Alan Hartman, in my head. Alan was quite a motivator. A motivating man. He could motivate even the most unmotivated people around us. He could motivate you. He died a believer, died of cancer. And now he's perfect in your presence. But I know as much as Alan motivated people, he was a man who struggled. He struggles like all of us do. He struggles like me. We get weighted down by the things of life. We get so caught up in the horizontal, Lord, that we forget we're even running a race. We feel like sometimes we're just sitting alone on an island, being oppressed on every side by the things we see. Help us this morning, help me this morning to be an encourager to those around us that, that maybe are lagging behind. Help me not to be so critical I, I rejoice in the fact that these folks are here today. I do. And that's what I need to be my focus. But I'm also told in the scriptures that I need to look around. I need to oversee diligently. And if I see those that are struggling, and, and I know that's what's going on, that are lagging behind, I need to come alongside them and encourage them. Come on, it's tough. It's tough in this race. But push on, push forward. Keep pushing. Help us all to be encouragers. Help us not to get sidetracked and sidelined by our own bitterness, our own agendas, our own ideas. Help us to begin to look outward and not inward. We do need to look inward, but it can't just stop there. It needs to look outward too. Thank you for meeting with us today. As I'm challenged by this, I pray that my brothers and sisters are challenged by it too. Thank you for your precious word. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.